So before we get started, uh, I would like to talk about the modded Minecraft community for a sec because it's unlike anything else that I've ever seen. You guys might know of mods from other games like Skyrim or Starbound. Mods in other games tend to change things like surface cosmetic features, like hair or faces. Sometimes they add UI improvements. Sometimes they add new content that keeps in line with content that already exists, like new quests or new NPCs. Minecraft is a totally different beast. In Minecraft, mods can add entirely new tech trees, new progression systems, new mechanics, they can wrench around existing mechanics. Uh, they can add plot. They can add skill trees. Giant adventure sites. Minecraft mods transform the game in ways that I've never seen anywhere else. Anyway, there are literally thousands of these mods. One mod site, CurseForge, has over 13,000 mods on it. And there are hundreds more mods that distribute their mods independently. Back of the envelope math suggests that these mods have a combined download total of 2 billion downloads. At the height of its popularity, before Microsoft took over, uh, over 8.5 million Minecraft installs on the computer were playing with modded clients, and nearly three times as many were playing on modded servers. Forge and Bucket, for those curious. Uh, console and mobile players are out of luck, of course. Uh, same goes with people on the new Windows 10 version. Only Java players get these particular fun toys. Sorry, guys. Um, anyway, these mods are often used in conjunction with each other. You don't just play with one mod, you play with many. Dozens. Sometimes even over a hundred. Uh, you don't want, just want to see how one mod works, you want to see how it interacts with other mods. But sometimes, when you add multiple mods together, you get strange conflicts. As just a simple example, you could have five mods that all add copper into the game. Then you end up with five different versions of copper, one from each mod, none of which stack, and all of which might only be able to be used in the recipes in the mods that made them. This is dumb. People don't like that. But it can be a pain to fix this sort of problem. This gives rise to the notion of mod packs. Skilled people can package together a set of mods for the convenience of other players. But they don't just throw mods together. They also smooth out these little issues, like making modifications to the configuration files so that all the mods use the same kind of plastic, or making the machines from one mod use the components from a different mod in order to blend their tech trees together for a more cohesive experience. Some of the elaborate mods do other gimmicky things, like, for instance, they could add their own tutorials or their own plot lines. Um, they can have different scenarios, like towns full of NPCs, or trying to survive on a desert planet with the ruins of an ancient civilization, or being in a biodome trapped by the remnants of a hostile purple bioweapon. I did that one. Um, anyway, the best mod packs are downloaded millions of times, thus making the mods within them also downloaded millions of times. When these mod pack makers make their packs, they try to only add the best mods. This means that some ones, uh, like for instance this mod that adds a new magic system, they tend to get added to many packs and get tens of millions of downloads. Other mods, like this one that adds eight plain colored blocks, get a few hundred or so at most. Usually, the best mods become the most popular because of good game design. Out of the thousands of mods that a pack author could add to their mod pack, the mods with the best designs tend to rise to the top. This makes for a fascinating study of game design. Some of the questions that we can ask is what makes some mods more popular than others? What's good about their design that makes pack makers pick them over others? What makes some mods rise to the top and others fail? That's what I want to talk about today, but I've got a lot of material. It would be like drinking from a fire hose, so we'll need to move quickly. Let's get started. Point number one. Realism is not a substitute for game design. Let me tell you the story of a modder named Reka Koleski. Reka loved realism. When he had a design question, he would turn to realism to come up with an answer. Reka made a rod mod called RotaryCraft. It revolved around a power system that used rotating axles to power machines, 
to do things like grind ores or fire lasers or power uh, mining machines and so forth. Thing was, this mod is complex. You think, oh, this thing rotates, so it powers this other thing. Maybe even, oh, this thing rotates fast, so it makes this other thing work faster or better. It's not that simple. The axles had both a speed and a torque, and the machines needed a specific input speed and torque in order to work. If you messed up, bad things would happen. Things could break. The axles could break. Things could melt into lava. Things could randomly explode. And when you go to the manual for help, you would end up getting belittled and scolded. People asked Reka if maybe he could just make the rotating axles power an electric generator, such as in other mods. Then instead of this whole axle nonsense, you could just send electric power to your machines. That would be simpler, right? Well, let me read Reka's response to this idea. I do things realistically. Do you really want Rotary Craft to use realistic electrical power with current loops, magnetic induction, nodal analysis, and electrical phase calculations? You will change your electricity is simple position rather rapidly. So don't do that. Make it fun instead. I don't know of any game that uses nodal analysis and electrical phase calculations in their electricity system. Realism should take a backseat to fun. To show how far Reka's dedication to realism went, let me explain how his cross-mod interaction worked. Another mod's power system used a unit of power called RF. Reka decided to make a machine that converts his spinning axle power into RF. So how did he pick the conversion rate? Well, there's a machine in a different mod that can melt cobblestone into lava. You can see a picture of it here. That costs 320,000 RF. In real life, melting a cubic meter of rock into lava takes 5.2 megajoules of energy. Reka's spinning axles, based on their torque and speed, can be calculated to deliver a certain number of joules of energy. That's right. The conversion between his power system and the RF power system is based on the melting point of rock in real life. Is this balanced? Is it fun? He didn't care. It was realistic. I consider this to be lazy game design. Instead of taking the work to find a fair, balanced, and interesting conversion, he punted and he let simple arbitrary math figure it out. His dedication to realism deprives him of the ability to make his mod as fun as possible. You can fulfill the target fantasy of power from spinning axles without needing to be a slave to realism while doing so. Reka's mods used to be really popular because he came from a time where there were only hundreds of mods and he had a high degree of visual polish. This made him popular and people forgave his game design methodology, but recently his mods have started to fall out of favor. This realism trumping design issue is just one of the reasons among many. So how does this fit with real life games? Let me tell you about a tabletop role-playing system called GURPS. It's an RPG that is heavy on realism and simulation. Do you suddenly lack a vital organ because it disappeared for some reason? There's rules for that. Uh, is your blade two inches longer than your opponent's and you want to know what, exam what advantage you get? There's rules for that, too. Did a wizard trap you in a force field and use a spell to destroy the air inside of it, exposing you to hard vacuum? There's rules for that. Do you want to know the chances of you twitching while being operated on without anesthetic, causing the surgeon to mess up and cut a major artery, causing you to bleed out unless a tourniquet is applied? There's rules for all of that. Uh, GURPS, at its heart, is a simulation, not a game. The game is notorious for being slow to play at the table unless you've memorized hundreds of rules and slight miscellaneous modifiers. You could ignore them, sure, and make up numbers to fill in for the ones you haven't memorized, but that feels awful, especially after the fact when you realize your character should have died. Its game ability is reduced by its accuracy. While some people can find that interesting and fun, GURPS, despite its longevity, has never achieved the popularity of much younger tabletop games. Let me tell you about a different game, League of Legends. In it, people fight each other, and that's basically the whole game. Let me introduce you to some of the playable characters. Meet Malphite. He is a living mountain. Meet the Kindred. They are the literal gods of death. Meet Aurelion Sol. He is a giant space dragon that makes stars in his spare time. Now meet Fiora. 
She is a really good sword fighter. So, what happens when the really good sword fighter takes on the star birthing space dragon? She actually has about a 50% chance of winning. You see, League of Legends cares about game balance, realism be damned. And they don't care about narratively explaining why Fiora can win this matchup. They refuse to make all the fighters weak lore-wise as Fiora because then they can't include Malphite, Kindred, or Aurelion Soul. And they won't make all the fighters as strong as Aurelion Soul because then they can't have normal people like Fiora, or Garen, or Miss Fortune. And why do they care? Well, look at her. She is a pirate queen, a well-known archetype that some people might have fun playing as. The game can support more target experiences because she is in it. She makes the game experientially richer. The developers are sort of making a Runeterra Super Smash Brothers. They don't care about the unobtainable goal of a perfectly realistic game. So that's enough for that point. Number two, balance your game assuming that your players know all the answers because they do. A long time ago, there were no wikis, game FAQs were unreliable, and game companies wanted to sell hint guides. Because of that, strange or esoteric knowledge about a game could give you a huge advantage. There could, for instance, be hidden panels in the wall full of loot, or riddles that you could solve to open chests full of valuable equipment, or other such mechanics that reward the player for knowing something. This implies a tricky balancing problem. Do you balance the game assuming that the players know all the right stuff and have all the advantages? Or do you balance it assuming that they don't know what they're doing and that the players uh, will have to figure it out? If you balance it assuming if people know everything, then the people who don't know everything will end up being frustrated. But if you assume that the players don't know everything, then the players who do know everything will have a piece of cake. So where do you want to balance? Probably for the low-end players, right? Well, not necessarily. Let me introduce you to a mod called Batania. It's a fantastic mod, by and large. It's about nature magic, where you automate certain tasks by planting magic flowers. Some flowers produce mana, and others consume it in order to do cool things. There's one mana-producing flower. It's called the Dandelion. It's very strange. It replicates Conway's Game of Life, which I guess fits with the nature theme of the mod. What's the game of life? Put simply, it's a complicated computer algorithm that spawns and despawns cell blocks based on certain rules. In the Batania mod, you use the Dandelion by putting down some starting configuration of cell blocks and blockers around the flower. Then you start the flower running. If any cell block spawns too close to the magic flower, then all of the cell blocks disappear and the flower produces mana based on how long the algorithm had been running before the cell blocks touch the flower. So obviously the goal then is to make the algorithm run for as long as possible without touching the flower so that the cell blocks give as much mana as possible when they disappear. On the surface, this is a clever puzzle. Where do you put the starting cell blocks? Where do you put the blockers? You can spend time optimizing it and trying to figure out different ways to increase your mana yield. Except, then some punk programmer on Reddit wrote a genetic algorithm to derive the optimal Dandelion set starting setup. Are you ready? Ta-da! There it is. The best setup. Take a picture of it because now you can use it to generate what the mod author describes as a frankly ludicrous amount of mana. And you don't have to mess around with it and solve any puzzles to get it, either. Just build this and hit go. You're done. So obviously, the Dandelion has two problems. First, the puzzle is basically non-existent for anybody who goes online, which, to be honest, is most players. And secondly, who do you balance it for? There is a big gap in mana generation between the optimal Dandelion setup and a naive solution. I think the mod author currently has it balanced so that people who go to Reddit and steal the solution don't get an abusive amount of mana. Thing is, that makes the flower useless for everybody else. Other mana generating flowers are a much more cost efficient solution. Even if you want to solve the puzzle, there's not much point. Because unless you're a programmer who can write a genetic algorithm to solve it for you, you're not going to solve it well enough to get reasonable mana given its current balance. 
If you want a lot of mana, it's better to, for instance, make a cake reactor. Cake reactors are, are things, believe it or not, in this mod. Anyway, all of the fun is gone from this flower. And don't even get me started on Psy. This mod adds a node-based programming language that lets you program spells that you fire out of a special spell gun. If you're a programmer, you have all the power in the world and can kill the Ender Dragon in just a few shots from tools made of nothing but diamonds and a little gold. If you're not a programmer, it's basically useless. Unless you copy spell diagrams from Reddit, in which case you can be godlike too. You'll notice this same problem in a lot of older games, and the older the game is, the worse it gets, in my opinion. Take NetHack. There's an Easter egg in it, where if you scrawl the name Elbereth in the dust, monsters can't attack you for as long as you stay in that square. Why? Because Elbereth is the obscure Middle-earth elven goddess of protection. Of course. But wow, immunity to monsters by knowing an obscure Easter egg? Back then, you'd literally need to read the source code in order to find it. Talk about Arcana. And now, it's just common knowledge, and any serious NetHack player uses it. Just look at the NetHack wiki for detailed analyses about it. Wikis, Let's Plays, Reddit, and streamers have changed the way that hidden information works in games. Don't assume hidden knowledge will stay hidden. Adding advantages for hidden knowledge in your game will only serve to either make knowledgeable players overpowered or frustrate ignorant players. Number three, don't be afraid to throw work away. Let me tell you the story of Thoundcraft. Thoundcraft is a mod about being a mage. Its creator, Azenor, does an excellent job making mechanics that support that theme to try and make you feel like a mage. One of the things mages do in fiction is study and research. How often do you see mages portrayed studying in ancient tomes or conducting magic experiments? All the time. So Azenor added a research system, and it's a big deal for Thoundcraft. It's the way you unlock new spells and magical technologies in the mod, the very core of its tech tree. Let me go through the history of that. In the 1.2.4 version of Thoundcraft, you did research by studying objects. You did this by putting them in a block called a casatorium. A bar fills up, the item is consumed, and sometimes a research theory pops out. The more valuable the object, the greater the chance of a theory. So studying diamonds is obviously better, but more expensive than studying cobblestone. So what do players do? Well, they make a dozen casatoriums and a cobble generator, and then, using a different mod's transport pipes, they fed cobble into the casatorium automatically. Then they could go make a sandwich. Free infinite research. So as an artist, he scrapped that idea. He rebuilt it from scratch. In 1.5.10, you would feed the research table specific items. Sometimes they would give you research points, sometimes not. It depends on what you're researching. Eventually, you figure out what items a given piece of research requires, such as this magical cloth that requires that you study string and crafting tables. You put in tons of those items, put in enough of the right items, and research pops out. This was way better because you couldn't automate it, but there was still a huge problem. Your character was the one studying, not you. You're just putting in items. This felt more like you were buying new features and less like you were researching it didn't fulfill the target fantasy. So he scrapped that idea, 1.7.10, new research system. This time, when you want to research something, you get a little mini game. You've got a hex grid with different concepts on it, like weapons and darkness and tools. Your job is to connect them with other concepts. You spend research points to put other concepts in the grid. If the concept is similar enough to the one next to it, they link up. If you somehow link all of the concepts together, then the research is complete. Where do you get these research points? You get them by scanning objects through a magical magnifying class, glass. Crops give you crop points, pickaxes give you mining points, etc. Also, you can only scan every type of object once to avoid abuse. This was awesome. Now players could actually participate in the research by playing a minigame. Solving the puzzle makes you feel like you're making a research breakthrough. Relating concepts to each other feels like magical discovery. But can you guess the problem? 
It's a solved problem. Our previous point was assume players know all the answers to all the problems. In this case, the solutions to the minigames are posted online. The minigame is pointless and it becomes nothing but a tedious grind for the players. The solving a research puzzle thematic is lost. So he scrapped it again. Next idea, research involves a stack of cards. Using inspiration points, you draw cards into your hand and then you play them. The cards have thematic names like Breakthrough and Ponder. Playing them in turn tells a story about how you came to your conclusions. Some cards require that you complete specific tasks, such as collecting certain items to use at the research table. You can change what cards are in the deck of research option by changing what blocks are close to your desk. Each research project was its own journey, and no online guide could dictate the path that you took because it was determined by the cards you drew. This research system showed a lot of promise. It had some bugs in it, and it felt a little incomplete, and the author abandoned Minecraft modding after a nearly seven-year tour of duty, but with a little more polish, this system looked like it would have been the best iteration yet. What does this teach us? <clears throat> well, if Azenor had kept derping around with his first research system, the one with all the cobblestone pipes, for instance, and he tried to hold on to as much of it as possible, we never would have gotten to the research system that we have now. Instead, he wasn't afraid to identify the core conceptual problems, scrap the entire thing, and build something better. Sometimes that's what we need to do as designers, and big companies do it all the time. The best example that I could think of is Project Titan. Titan was an MMO being developed by Blizzard. It had a sort of a feel like The Incredibles, a near-future semi-cyberpunk setting where you'd be ordinary people by day doing MMO minutia like crafting, cooking, etc., and you are high-tech, superheroic members of shadowy organizations by night, running missions against each other in a PvP setting for control of the world map. The reaction was split. Blizzard reports that the combats were fun, but the MMO part of it, the day jobs, were boring. They stuck with it, trying over and over to fix it, until they eventually gave up and scrapped the entire MMO portion of the game, leaving only the combat in, and they amped the PvP part of it up to 11. The result? Anyone familiar with it? It's Overwatch. Blizzard's fourth successful IP was based on a scrapped game. Ever wonder why Overwatch has a weird amount of lore and cinematics in it for a first-person shooter? My guess is that this is the reason why. Overwatch is the legacy of the scrapped Project Titan. And thank goodness they did that instead of releasing a shoddy MMO. Number four, don't neglect toys for technology. There's this mod that I love probably a little too much. It's called Thermal Expansion. It's a tech mod based on futuristic technology where you get machines that process minerals in different ways. These machines are powered by generators that produce energy when you put stuff like coal, lava, or redstone dust into them. You start the mod off by getting gold and some other base metals in order to make a pulverizer. Pulverizers can crush metals into dust. You can put these dusts together to make alloys. One of these alloys is called Invar. Using Invar, you unlock a new tier of machines called Hardened Machines. One of these machines is the Induction Smelter. You can use it to smelt things together that don't have dust forms. One of these combinations is Lead and Obsidian, which makes something called Hardened Glass. Hardened Glass is used to make a new tier of machines called Reinforced. One of these machines is the Magma Crucible. Magma Crucibles can melt more items, such as Redstone, a bucket of molten redstone with some various dust to make Signalum. Signalum unlocks a new tier. This tier unlocks a new material called Endarium. Using Endarium, you can make a new tier called Resonant. At any point, you can take something uh, from your later tier and use it to upgrade something from previous tier to make it work faster and more efficiently. But do you notice that something is missing here? What do you do with all of this stuff? Sure, you've made machines that unlock machines that unlock machines, but what's the point? Does it add to your character in any way? Does it give you any new abilities? Does it reward you in some way? Maybe you don't need that stuff. Maybe progress for the sake of progress is its own reward. If that's the case, then boy do I have a game for you. 
<laughs> well, look at it, though. You're trying to get as many cookies as possible. You click the cookie to get more cookies, which you can use to buy cursors to click the cookie for you, and then that gives you enough cookies to buy grannies who will bake cookies for you. That gives you enough cookies to buy farms that you could use in order to grow more cookies, which eventually gives you enough cookies to buy giant antimatter condensers that condense the dark matter in the universe into quadrillions of cookies. <laughs> but why, what good are these cookies? What do they do? Nothing. All you can use them for is various buildings to get more cookies. But because you can't do anything with the cookies, why should you care about getting them at all? Some people find this gameplay very compelling. Notice that I use the word compelling and not fun. You can make the player do boring things. I'll explain how in a bit. Um, I play this game sometimes, and when I do, I can't stop clicking the expletive cookie. <laughs> but am I having fun? No, I'd be far better off playing a game like League of Legends or RimWorld or basically anything else. Some mods fall in this trap. Some games do, too. In Minecraft community, we call this sort of thing tech. Tech, in this context, is a progression system in which the, the rewards for progressing is the ability to progress further. It is cyclic and it is compulsive. So how do you break out of this tech cycle? Toys. A toy, in this context, is something cool that rewards the player for completing the tech. I threw a couple of design decisions from Batania under the bus, so let's bring it back and give it credit where credit is due. Batania is a tech mod. Even though it is themed around magic, it is still a tech mod. You use devices made from gold to harvest mana from flowers, which you use to make mana steel, which you use to make runes, which make better flowers and devices, which let you make terra steel, which you use to make an elven gateway, which you use to get elementium, which you use to summon a Gaia guardian, which gets you Gaia ingots. It might look fancy, but notice that at its core, it's all just a tiered tech progression. Gold, mana steel, terra steel, elementium, Gaia ingots. Sort of like thermal expansion. But then there's the rest of Batania. Here's just a tiny part. A rod that can see ores through walls. A crystal that raises a plot of ground into the sky to make a floating island. A giant hammer that tears through the ground. Armor that makes pixies spawn whenever you get attacked. A tiny bouncing potato that believes that you can do the thing. <laughs> a giant gun that turns withers pink. Sparks that turn you into a beam of light to let you fly through the air. A sword that throws exploding swords. I think it's a reference to some anime. Um, <laughs> to get... It, why do you go through the tech tree in Batania? To get the cool stuff. And the deeper you go into the mod, the cooler the stuff gets. Terraria, a different mod, has this nailed. The tech in that game is as much a toy as it is tech. The Frostbolt spell makes the dungeon reasonable to beat, but it's also fun to use. The bee gun shoots bees, which can rip apart some bosses, but also it's fun to use. Rocket boots make it easier to get around and gives you mobility when fighting bosses and caving, but also rocket boots. I mean, come on, right? Uh, also, even outside of the tech progression, there are plenty of toys that exist just because they're cool. Reach extenders for people who like to build, slime squirt guns, confetti, little glass cages that you can trap rabbits in, about a bajillion different kinds of toilets to decorate your house with, <laughs> teleporters and redstone-like signal transmission. Terraria has excellent toys. Thermal Expansion is picking up on this too. They've made pressurized tubes like those ones in the drive-thru at banks, except they transport you. Uh, a machine that vaporizes potions so that everybody in the area that breathes it in gets its effects. This is really fun with poison. Um, backpacks that can extend your inventory. A machine that enchants books for you by using liquid XP. It's fun. That's the point. Thermal expansion used to be pretty techy, but the longer it lives, the more toys they add to the mod as well. Number five, reward players for having fun, not for being bored. When I was developing Blightfall, I ran into some unexpected behavior from one of my players. She was building giant cobble towers into the sky and then mining them back down again. 
then building another one, and then mining it back down, and then building another one, and then mining it back down. And she was bored, really bored. I asked her why she was doing this, and the answer surprised me. Let's back up a bit for context. Blightfall had a lot of mining in it. You would mine in area A, which gave you materials hard enough to mine the ores in area B, which gave you materials hard enough to mine in area C, and so forth. It was a little mining tech tree. I was pretty proud of it. The problem was, some people didn't like mining. So I had to do something to make mining more enticing so that those people wouldn't get bored. I found a mod called Iguana Tweaks. Iguana Tweaks made it so that your pickaxes would level up the more that you used them. And that's wonderful, right? Now mining is more fun because even if you have a hard time finding ore, you still get to see a little number go up. And people like to see little numbers go up. Well, there was one problem. It worked too well. The playtester, making the giant cobble towers, she said she wanted to train her pickaxe to get it to a high level. So she was placing blocks specifically so that she could mine them. I asked why she didn't just go mining to increase her pick's XP. She said, because I feel like I'll want a high level pickaxe to go mining with, won't I? So I've got to grind for pickaxe levels here in my base where it's safe. Look, it sounds dumb, right? But it's bizarrely common. If you attach rewards to the wrong things, you end up with players adopting dysfunctional behaviors to try and take advantage of those rewards. Players are myopic and tend to prioritize short-term advantages over having fun. Let's say that there's a boss that you can cheese that by hiding in a weird location and shooting his left foot over and over and over again until the boss dies. It would be a tedious, time-consuming process, but very reliable and very safe. The players will do it, and they will miss out on a fun, awesome boss fight that you designed. And they'll be bored when they hold the attack button down for an hour. And they will feel clever for doing it. Let's talk more about Batania. You remember how you would generate mana with flowers? Well, the weakest mana generating flowers were called day blooms. They were cheap and simple. You would put them in sunlight and they would generate mana. Using that mana, you could make a flower called an endoflame. An endoflame would generate mana if you threw coal on it. The problem was people didn't like that. They wanted to have their coal and their mana. So instead of using endoflames, they would just use more day blooms. Thing is, making setups to auto-feed coal to endoflames is an interesting and fun engineering problem. So the author of Batania didn't want players to just spam daybooms. <laughs> so he made it so that if two daybooms were next to each other, they'd interfere with each other and produce less mana. So players just made their daybloom farms bigger. So he nerfed daybooms so that they only made a trickle of mana, and then the daybloom farms just got really, really big. So then he went with the nuclear option. He made it so that all day blooms would die after one in-game week. Now, all day bloom farms were temporary, so there was no point in making them massive anymore. You're done. Make an endo flame setup already. And the players went crazy. They hated it. For a while, it died down pretty quickly, actually. And now, Batania is still massively popular and far stronger, game design-wise, than it was in the era of Daybooms, because it forced players to have fun. Giving the players rewards for doing boring things will make the players do boring things. Sometimes this is a mistake, sometimes it's a band-aid for poor game design, but either way, you want to cut the boring parts out of your game. If you find the players doing boring stuff, punish them for it and reward them for doing interesting stuff instead. The tower stacking problem in Blightfall, how would I fix it today? First off, I would quarter the durability of all of the picks in the game in order to make needlessly pointing breaking blocks unpalatable. I would remove the XP gain for breaking random blocks uh, and uh, let's do make them not want to make to break blocks pointlessly. I would give them tons of XP and allow them to recover the durability on their pick if they broke ores specifically. I would give them tons of mining experience. 
Finally, I would uh, make it so that you had uh, some small amount of durability gain slowly over time. That way, players who would use their picks in order to uh, do base construction and stuff wouldn't be uh, penalized. Now, players don't want to mine out long swaths of blocks because their tools will break. There will be no strip mining or branch mining. Instead, the players would want to optimize their ore to block ratio, mining the most ores for the least number of blocks broken. And how do you do that? You do it by caving. You go into caves full of monsters. Caves with interesting natural features. Now, we have redirected players from the safe, boring parts of the game to the exciting and dangerous parts of the game, with nothing but a few changes to the durability and the XP system. Point number six, give your players creative options. There was a pack released a while back that was pretty professionally polished. It was called SevTech. It took dozens of mods and blended them into one cohesive tech tree. It did this by changing the recipes around so that the tech trees were stacked on top of each other. Near the end of one mod's tech tree, they'd tack on the beginning of another mod's tech tree. This way, it would lead you carefully through the game one mod at a time so that you could get a little bit of everything. There was just one problem. You had to do everything. Not all mods are interesting to all people. For instance, the Abyssal Craft mod is based on the Lovecraftian mythos, where you get magical power by building statues to the Elder Gods and then using them to perform dark rituals. When my wife and I played, we had to do this sort of thing to get to the starting point in the next mod in the progression, Astral Sorcery. The thing was, the Lovecraftian mythos squicks my wife out. <coughs> We're Christian. Normally, we're the sort of magic is fantasy and therefore pretty cool Christians, but we draw the line at pretending to get power from evil gods by pretending to pray to them. That makes us pretty uncomfortable. But we grit our teeth, did as little abyssal craft as possible, and then moved on to the next mod in the progression that we actually wanted to play. Now, SevTech was pretty popular, mostly because of a certain streamer that publicized the crap out of it. But I don't know of anybody personally who completed it or even got halfway. Here's a slide of our ghost town on our server. I asked around and I found one common complaint, options. In normal modded Minecraft, let's say you wanted to smelt some ore. How do you do it? A thermal expansion powered furnace? A Miyazaki-style demon in a fireplace? A hammer of smelting. Uh, melt the ores in a tinker's construct smeltery. Uh, use a common furnace like a neoluddite. Or maybe a common furnace with some awesome bellows attached, for instance. Depending on your tastes and interests, there are lots of different ways to accomplish most tasks. Not in SevTech. In SevTech, they locked the tech tree down, so the only way to do A was with B, and the only way to do B was with C to try and force you to do everything. Sure, it arbitrarily expanded playtime and it let you experience all the mods in the pack at least a little, but it also made it so you couldn't do what you wanted to do. You had to do what the pack maker wanted you to do. There was no choice, and choice is the essence of Minecraft. So one at a time, all my friends and family got bored and left my SevTech server. I wanted to like it, I really did. The author blended all of the mods into a single gigantic tech tree in a way that was beautiful. It was a work of art, but I just couldn't stomach it, and I don't know anyone else who could either. Choice is the essence of video games. It's what separates games from movies. Games are inherently an interactive medium. We must give the player choices. A game that does this really well is uh, I Expect You to Die a VR game in which you're a James Bond figure trying to figure out how to escape various death traps. In one level, a bomb comes out, and you need to cut wires to defuse it. There's a knife in the glove compartment that lets you do just that. Well, my nephew played this game, and when he did so, the bomb came out before he found the knife. So what did he do? He picked up a wine bottle, smashed it against the dashboard, and used the broken bottle to cut the wires. It was instinctive, primal, unrehearsed, and I had never seen it before. 
But in that moment, my nephew solved a problem in the way he thought was best, and in so doing, he became the hero of his own story. Whenever you design a problem, make sure that it has several different solutions. Give your players the creative tools needed to solve things their way. It'll make the players feel more emotionally invested in your game. Let's look at some mods. This mod, here, which is about that mod. Number three, with 63 million downloads. It's Tinker's Construct, the most popular content mod in modded Minecraft. What does it do? It lets you create your own tools, like custom picks, where you can pick a separate material for the binding, the handle, and the pick head. Different materials have different strengths, weaknesses, and special abilities, and you can customize them how you want. Uh, another mod, uh, this one here, number 15, uh, with 45 million downloads. It's called Pam's Harvest Craft. It adds 1,400 new kinds of food. As of the time of writing, Pam's probably added more by now because she updates constantly. These mods are so popular because they give the players choices. So, we've covered a lot and we've seen a lot of mods. Let's review what we've covered. Number one, realism is not a substitute for game design. Number two, balance your game assuming that the players know all the answers. Number three, don't be afraid to throw work away. Number four, don't neglect toys for tech. Number five, reward players for having fun, not for being bored. And number six, give your players creative options. So, what's our conclusion? First, modded Minecraft is awesome. I hope <laughs> that you come away realizing that Minecraft isn't just Legos with zombies tacked on. All of you who have Minecraft accounts should go out and play a mod pack. A good one to start with is called Feed the Beast Academy. It will walk you through the basics and get you started so that getting into modded Minecraft isn't overwhelming. Number two, learn from what you play. Whenever you play a game, let the designer part of your brain chew away on it in the background. Find out what's fun and what's not. This will make your game design stronger. Third, get in the thick of things. You learn best by doing, and if you've got mild programming experience, you can make mods or mod packs for a variety of different games. Test out designs. Let players tell you what's fun and what's not. Learn from their feedback. Thank you. This presentation should be available online once LTUE is over if you want to review it. Um, my indie company is releasing its first game next month. It's called Final Winter. Um, at any rate, checking the time, we don't have time for any questions in here, but we have unlimited time for questions out in the hallway if anybody is interested in speaking to me afterwards. Thank you. Thank you.